Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 161, Reducing Stitch Counts Subtle to Savage. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome in to the show. Happy to have you guys here on this Education Friday, as I am always happy to have you guys joining in and enjoying this time to share with your fellow embroiderers to discuss the way in which we digitize things, the way we make our stitches the way we want them to be, the way we increase our ability to make profits for our customers and to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is reducing stitch count. And you might think, how is that near and dear to your heart? How is this a creative endeavor? Uh, what does this mean for someone who maybe isn't doing this commercially? And I'd say, here's the deal. Whether it's creative or commercial, time spent on the machine is not necessarily, I don't know, at least for me, my favorite time of the embroidery process. I'm here for the creative work. And honestly, if I'm in the commercial zone, I am here to make money. Both of these things require me to be efficient. And so I am very much trying to reduce stitch counts, not to mention in the pursuit of reducing stitch counts, we also gain back the hand of our garment. If you ever hear somebody talk about something being bulletproof. That's generally because we have high stitch counts, heavy density, materials that aren't working together, and making this thing a little worse, making everything about wearing our garment harder to handle. And so for me, reducing stitch counts, working on that efficiency is a worthwhile endeavor no matter where you're coming from. So hopefully for those of you who come and chose to be here today, we'll have something to talk about as far as that. You can talk about your concepts for reducing stitch counts. And I'm gonna get into the art and design side of this for how I pitched this to customers and how I help to deal with people who are working on uh, limited budgets or who are working with garments, apparel that does not hold up. So throughout this, when we're talking about reducing stitch count, uh, and admittedly, I made this funny kind of comment about, hey, it's subtle to savage, just because some of the things we do are subtle. We can make changes to the way we set our stitches up to the variables that we use that enable us to get lower stitch counts and lighter hand without necessarily changing the look of the piece itself. Those are subtle changes. Those are things we can do that just help us get there. And there's some that are a little less subtle and some that are more subtle. This is actually a spectrum from the subtle to the savage changes. What are the savage changes? That's where we get into things like art and design, art alterations, where we actually change the design that we're looking at in order to get something that is lower stitch count that holds up on lighter garments and that is decently uh, budget friendly for those folks who can't afford a giant full back piece. Uh, I am gonna go ahead and let you guys say uh, know that one of the reasons I'm talking about this um, is because I have been tasked to once again discuss jacket back pieces. Usually people are coming to me to ask, how do you embroider or how do you digitize jacket back pieces? And they're talking about, man, we've got this difficult piece. It is scaring us to work on. It is hard to manage. And what should we do in order to make that thing work better? Uh, and what is that process of digitizing a very difficult, very large piece? However, when I'm talking about digitizing for reducing stitch counts with jacket backs. It's about efficiency and there's something else to it. Um, the decency that people kind of have to say, all right, something's really difficult. I know it's hard for you to get to. There's a lot of detail in it. I get that. And that's one of the digitizing sides. We've talked about it before. We can talk about breaking down big designs again, but this time I'm talking about some of the tricks and tips that we have in order to reduce those in inherently large stitch counts that come from jacket back designs and big pieces. So like I said, we're going to talk about all kinds of different stuff today. Hopefully this is interesting to you. If not, by all means, if you're coming here and you don't want to talk about this, let me know in the comments what you're actually here for. We can do a little question and answer toward the end. And I'm happy to come up with topics in the future that are really more up your alley. We're always looking for topics. After you've done 161 of these episodes, you know that there's always a need for more topics down the road to figure out uh, where we're going to teach. And I want to be here for you and the problems you're having. So without any further ado, let's talk to a couple of the live folks that are here. If you're in the hashtag replay squad, that's cool. Skip this part. Jump back in and leave your comments if you want. But we like to always talk to the people who are here commenting and discussing. So first we have Cindy King out of Texas saying, good afternoon. I know you do everything big in Texas, so you probably would love to reduce some of the stitch counts on big pieces. I know I've done lots of big jacket backs myself, but uh, glad to see you here. we got Scott coming in from Sunrise Tactical Gear saying, happy Friday, Cindy, and to all of us. Uh, Joe Rita saying hello to everybody. Hi, Joe Rita. Happy to see you here as well. 
Barb from Minnesota Custom Made coming in. Uh, Identity Threads Company, feel free to share your name if you want to. But if not, we can just call you by your company name and, hey, go look them up. You never know. <laughs> Tell us where you're coming out of. Might get a new job today. You never know. And uh, also, we have everybody talking to each other. And Vincent coming in saying, hi, great topic. Uh, Candy and Vincent all hanging out. Happy to have you there. So glad to have you in. Let's talk about it, right? Let's discuss it. I'm going to show some examples. We'll talk about some things I've had to design to make this stuff work, and we're going to go through it. Might be a shorter show. I always say that and then end up going long, but it all depends on the questions you guys have and what you want to talk about as we get through this topic. Uh, suffice it to say, we'll bring back up the uh, thumbnail, which I often do, and just say, I've got these pieces here, and you're looking at all these different things. There's different designs and different colorways. There's uses of materials and applique. There's thick threads. There's all this stuff, and we're going to discuss how that all plays out. But the thing to remember on this is that there is no one way to handle reducing stitch count. Uh, frankly, it all has to do with what your customer is comfortable with, or if it's you, if it's something you're doing for yourself, what you're comfortable with for changing and what your goals are. Um, there are times where somebody just says to me, I have to have full coverage. Customer doesn't want applique applied materials and it has to be 12 inches wide. And I say, you're going to be in for a long stitch out and there's just not a ton you can do. Now, some of the subtle changes I'm going to offer you are things that a customer won't notice and that you and I uh, can certainly make use of depending on your equipment and how things run for you. And I'll talk about that. But there is a limit to this based on customer uh, comfortability. And I'm going to say this, some of the stuff I show you, why did I call it subtle to savage? There are things that I've done with customer logos or with customer concepts that not every digitizer is going to get to do because I earned the trust of the customer to the point that they let me do work that really is design work. It comes to a point where by the time I'm changing the design itself, that is design work. It's usually done before a digitizer touches things. But I still think even if you're contracting digitizing out or handling this in some other fashion, there's a good chance that if you're talking to a customer and giving them what I always say, those golden words that I tell you to tell them, which is, if this were my design, this is what I would do to make the best embroidery. If you're coming to them with that attitude and you tell them, hey, what you have is fantastic. This is where our budget is. This is what the material will hold up to. This is how big this piece is and we need to bring it down, You or you want me to bring it down because of a budgetary constriction, here are the, the goals you have. It's kind of like that cheap, fast, good triangle where you can only have two, well, big, cheap, good, same kind of thing. If we want really large pieces or really high coverage, because it could be that it's a smaller piece with incredibly high coverage, fully covered, cheap, good. Also, one of those triangles where you kind of, that Venn diagram where in the middle is just a nice big X because we aren't going to get that, right? Suffice it to say, if we talk to them about what those expectations are and say not, no, <laughs> but <laughs> here's the actual answer I could give you. Here is an option. Here's something that we could do and show them some versions of what's possible or maybe some self-directed projects that we undertake in order to show them interesting ways to cut down stitch count or interesting ways we could render their logo, there's a chance of us not only kind of gaining their trust, but either getting them to be on board with these ways of uh, reducing our stitch time of reducing stitch counts, or let them understand that if they want what they want, then maybe they need to change something else about the scope of the uh, decoration, whether it's having fewer pieces made or changing, uh, maybe they've got multiple locations, they can drop an entire location, or some other thing, maybe scale, we'll talk about that, right? There's multiple ways we can handle it. It really depends on what our customer comfortability is, and it depends on our communication skills, letting them know, here are your goals, here are the realities of those goals, what that means for execution, and here are the things that I can do to help you get the best embroidered result under your brief, meaning, for what you want, what you've required, what you've requested, and at the price that you are willing to pay. Now, honestly, um, constantly going for, you know, people who are bargain hunting, I'm just going to be honest with you, bargain hunters will always bargain hunt and they will be on to the next shop as soon as they have a deal. If someone is constantly, constantly negging you over your, your pricing, the chances are that they are not a great customer. In fact, uh, we have over Twitch. Can you give me your most savage embroidery tip? My most savage embroidery tip is fire customers who don't pay. And I know that sounds terrible, but 
If there is a customer who is continually saying the ditch count is too high, I can't pay for what you want when we want a giant jacket back. I don't want to pay for these awesome materials you're putting together. I don't want to pay when I want additional processes added to it. That customer who you spend 80% of your time on who is bringing you 20% of the revenue is not probably worth dealing with. And I'm not saying be mean and I'm not saying be rude. I am saying, however, that's probably what you need to do. Fire the customer who is not going to trade value for value. That's my most savage embroidery tip, my man. Uh, but hey, that is how that goes. The other savage embroidery tip is just because they bring you art and they have an initial graphic and a size that they think they want doesn't mean that that's the right answer. And sometimes you're going to have to give them the answer because they don't really know what they want. If they were experts, they could do it themselves. You're the expert. You got to guide them. There's your savage version of that one too. When they bring you that piece and they say it needs to be 15 inches square on that jacket back, give them the real price and tell them why or why not that is something that is within the realm of possibility and be serious. Uh, don't back up. Don't discount your work all the time. Don't constantly walk back into deeper and deeper discounts because you just race to the bottom and nobody wins. It's just how it is. And uh, yeah, Sunrise Tactical Gear says, uh, <laughs> I believe that was uh, Scott from Sunrise Tactical Gear. Uh, years ago, uh, my accountant told me it's okay to fire a customer. Absolutely. And honestly, you don't have to fire them like you're yelling and screaming. You just say, you know what? I don't think it's a good time for us to take on this project. I don't have any other way to make this work for me. Um, I can recommend you other people who are in town who you can work with, or I can recommend somebody online to do your decoration if you want to see if their prices are better, but this is what I can do. And then if you've got other customers to fill that machine and keep that needle going up and down, uh, get those customers in and don't worry about it. Because that's the thing. Reducing stitch count should be something we do to help people out who we want to serve and also to keep our production schedules lighter and clearer and to make our garments feel nice to wear so they drape and they don't feel bulletproof. It's not something we should be doing for someone who's continually bargain hunting, especially if what we end up doing is spending too much time, too much effort on something that's just reducing the profit that we're making and making it less likely for us to keep doing the job we love and for our company to be there when they want to come back in six months and do it again. I've said this a million times to folks that people say, oh, I've got somebody cheaper or they tell me a quote that is incredibly low, that is low for the industry and low for my shop. Invariably, I'll say, all right, you know what? I can't do that. That is a steal. Go have them do the work. If you're not happy with their work down the road, come to me. And then if I'm feeling uh, savage enough that day to use the word that I started with, I tell them flat out, come back to me in six months when they're shut. And I have no less than five times had somebody come back. I know it's probably more if I think about it, where someone comes back to me and the shop either has shut down or won't take those prices again in a few months. And generally they're unhappy with the service they got. Why? The shop was absolutely, you know, just dirt balling the price, got down to the lowest common denominator. They couldn't really keep it up. It's not profitable. And either the shop's closed and they run with their designs, run with the garments they brought in if they're doing customer supply, or they just show up and the people never have time to run and keep putting off their schedules because they're, they're burning midnight oil and they haven't paid enough or gotten paid enough to keep people on or to go to overtime when they have to for rushes or when they get overages. It often happens. And I don't want to see that happen to any of you guys if you're in the business. So price accordingly. Uh, I'm not saying be savage to someone's face, but when it comes down to, like I said, those people who you take 80% of your time serving but give you 20% of the value back, Realize that you can cut them, and that's fine, especially if you've got people waiting in the wings. Uh, don't don't cut your own throat to feed someone else while you're dying. It's just not worthwhile, and it's a bad use of your creativity and your time. All right, so let's go on from there. Let's actually talk about the topic at hand. I can, I can go on about the money side of this thing and valuing yourself all day long because I think it's something we often, especially those of you who have come from the hobbyist side of this thing, if you ever started out feeling like, oh, it's a thing I do on the side, it's a hobby, I can't charge that, other people don't charge that, or you're looking at Walmart for your comparisons, your comps for what things cost, you have to realize that you're providing a custom boutique experience, especially if you're doing custom digitizing work, which is kind of what we're talking about today. And you are providing a value that is over and above more than what you're comparing yourself to. It is apples to oranges. You are not doing this for fun alone. And if someone respects your creative work and also, hey, if your friends are on board with you, 
they shouldn't want friend discounts. They should want to pay full price because they're supporting what you do. You feel like discounting? Awesome. Do it. I've made a lot of free stuff for my friends. At the same time, I can't tell you how many of those friends told me, no, I want to pay for your work because I support what you're out there doing and I value it. And that's the right kind of friends to have if you can get them, right? The family price uh, the family price is a rough thing to deal with. I understand it. Lots of people want free work. As soon as you start working, you get a machine involved. You've got the equipment they don't have. But remember that this is a value you're providing to the community, to any of these communities, including your friends. And if a friend was really on board with you, they'd want to help as best they can to get you off the ground, right? And not just by wearing your stuff and telling everybody how great it is to get free gear. Um, like I said, you don't have to scalp on your friends, but I think this is something I feel strongly about because I've seen so many people become disheartened after they aren't getting back the value they're putting in. And a lot of it is that they just can't conceive of charging what they're really worth. And I want you to be audacious enough to ask for what you are worth. These are the limited hours of your lifespan. You are spending behind a machine, behind a computer, and they're never coming back. And I know that sounds drastic and crazy, but trust me, they really are there. I've spent more than 20 years of my life doing this. I know of what I speak. Uh, get some value for them and don't spend them with people who are grinding you down and telling you how low value your stuff is. I'm not saying price yourself out of the market. I am saying get something back for what you give, right? It's nice. So like I said, it's... <laughs> It's nice to give and receive. Hey, Cindy says, it's nice to have friends do free things, but it's sure nice to give back to a friend. Love it. Love giving back to a friend. I just love it. if a friend comes with the right supportive attitude, I'm in. If a friend comes to me and they constantly want me to do commercial level jobs with many, many pieces for everybody they know as if it's not work, that's where we have to start having the hard discussions for real. Uh, Barb came in with another comment about customers before I go on, since I got onto this tangent. Now I say, let's derail it when we want to. Um, Barb says, I agree, Scott. I don't have an issue with firing and turning down a customer. Usually they're back uh, agreeing to my pricing. But that being said, there are people I don't do work for. Yeah, you got to stand by what you feel on that. Um, I won't get into who I will and won't do work for. For me, it's cruelty. If you are a cruel, terrible person who wants other people to hurt, I don't want to deal with you. Uh, so that's me. Criminal enterprises and, and that sort, generally no, though I will say I've done a lot of bike clubs, which I don't really know uh, where they fall in that whole spectrum, but it is kind of a hard thing. So we'll, we'll talk about that. All right. So let's see. All right. So let's go ahead and talk to everybody about the actual thing we're dealing with. And that would have to be reducing stitch count, right? So let's talk about that. That's what we're here to do. We're here to talk about digitizing, talk about the process of what we're doing. And that's really what I'm looking for here, right? So I'm thinking, let's talk about the first part of it. We talked about it, like subtle to savage. Originally, I was going to go right into art and design, but I think I'm going to go back to the subtle side of this first. Let's make it a talk about the spectrum. Let's talk about the subtle side of it first and get rolling. So I think, honestly, these are the first things we should do. We don't want to make giant savage changes unless this is something that we know we're on board with our customer. Or, and I'm going to be honest with this, if they bring us a set of conditions for success that re really require it. If someone just comes to you with something crazy, and I'm actually going to give you an example of that from my own career, where they give you a set of conditions. Something has to be done by a certain time. You only have that period of time and it has to have this much coverage and it's crazy outscaled. Sometimes you have to go savage right from the get-go and say, the picture you've brought me is not the thing that we can do. So there is a time for that, but let's start with those subtle changes. And I think, you know, subtle changes are really the first place where we can make a big difference. And it's gonna be stuff that you think, all right, this couldn't possibly be that much. It couldn't possibly be a massive difference. But the truth of the matter is little changes often do make really large differences. So where are we talking about, right? First thing, I'm gonna bring up a really old design of mine you may have seen before. And we'll have a quick discussion about it. It's a jacket back that I did for a place called Roadway Equipment that was uh, working on the Burling North, Burlington Northern uh, Santa Fe Railway, so BNSF. But it, they had that kind of working out where they had this cool logo that you've seen me show a couple different times. And I'm going to bring that in. It's actually a roadrunner with a yucca and a little scene, a big Zia. But the thing is completely filled. And the first thing I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about applique later. Customer was fairly adamant at the time. Didn't want applique, didn't like the look of it. Even a 50% fill over applique, which I'm going to discuss later, was not something they were into. And so for this customer, the chances of me saying, all right, I want to move to applique because you guys have a bunch of fill, 
it wasn't going to go. They were not cool with it. They wanted full embroidery and that was the look. So ahead of time, I'm like, all right, my easy option, which I'm going to talk about again later in applique is gone. So I can't do that. So what do I have here is this nice big full piece, right? And it's pretty large. We're talking about a 10 inch, uh, a 10 inch by 10 inch piece. So it's not immense, immense. It's not beyond it, but it's pretty darn large. And it's a surely a lot of fillets in here because we're looking at about 89,000 stitches. One of my older designs here, so you're seeing me open it up in Wilcom. You know, I've got some other stuff already queued up and actually got some examples queued up in Stitch Artist right now. But this older design, I'm going to go ahead and show it in its original format so we can actually do some scaling and take a look at it. And I'll go ahead and uh, deselect that so you can just kind of see the pieces that are going on. We've got pretty standard fills. It was going on a lot of colors with a lot of contrast. So I had to have some underlay on it, probably more than you might use if you were going on uh, less contrasty materials. But we do have essentially single layers of fill underlay under the fills, um, just some very light edge runs to hold things together under the satins. Uh, not much more than that. We don't even have zigs on these really large satins here. There are no zigzags, nothing else. So I've already reduced my underlay to try and work on stitch count. But we're looking at this piece. The one thing I want to show you is sometimes it seems to be a fairly small thing that'll make the changes, right? So what I'm really getting after is there are multiple ways to get about it. This one, I've already done a lot of the first subtle changes. I'm going to talk about stitch lengths and some other stuff there. I've already done that. So the first thing I can tell them is, all right, you know, 10 inches is pretty big. I know this has kind of a smaller central circle in here. And so you might not want to do too much to it. But the easiest way to reduce a design is to resize it. We can resize the design by a very small amount and you end up with a pretty large change in stitch count. So should this become a problem, we have a design like this that has just a boatload of tatami fill. Like it, and honestly, I've done some of the stuff that you might expect. I, I've cut out, we're not seeing multiple layers on top of each other, have very small overlaps. I'm really trying to deal with everything in a way that's pretty efficient here. Um, and I've done some manual underlay on these pieces so that even in my uh, turning fills, I've got some nice underlays that are not going to be uh, too crazy or cost too much difficulty and not be really heavy. But if we grab this entire piece, right? So we go back out to scale, we grab this entire piece and we go ahead and scale this thing down by 10%, right? So we're going to 90% scale. That's our difference on screen, right? So it's not a ton. We have gone down, it's an inch because it's a 10 inch piece. We now have a nine inch piece. However, if we look down at that stitch count, that's now 76,000. So let's say I go from 89 to 76,000. I've got a 15% difference in stitch count for a 10% reduction in size. So the thing is we can cut somewhat just by doing a small scale change. Now, some customers are not gonna love that. Where this doesn't work is if you have somebody like me who is a truly massive individual, if you don't know, I am 6'4 and as wide as a house. Uh, the truth of the matter is if you start to make things really small on me, it's gonna look like I've got a left chest on my back. If you have a ton of big people, changing your jacket back even down by that inch might be a little dicey. But looking at this design, I can tell you on normal sizes without having to deal with that issue, um, if we just check at some of the stuff that's in here and make sure none of the details that are in uh, the yucca flowers are too, too tiny to run. They're not too bad. Everything's at a decent size. I don't have a lot of fine detail work. The engraving style work or the tiny hash marks that are in the feathers are not bad. And especially because this piece was really 10 inches, we're not seeing a bunch of technical issues. Um, lettering is all large enough. Even the small lettering inside of Santa Fe is large enough to handle that 10% change. Even though we've got some pretty small uh, holes in the A and the E. The other thing I could do is a very small amount of editing on that text to make sure that it ran cleanly. Or uh, the other thing we can do is resize elements. So let's say we had to do that resizing, but then our text got too small in this Burlington Northern section. We could take something like this roundel, this round logo that has the entire railway logo in it, bring it back up to size and cut away some of the other material inside of the Zia because it doesn't overly affect the look of the garment uh, or of the design on the garment we have things slightly out of scale from each other, but it doesn't massively change the look. We, all we would end up with, if we were careful about making this spacing in the upper right-hand side the same, is a slightly larger kind of penetration out into this area between the arms of the Zia. That really wouldn't change the garment much. So it would be a small art alteration, but the first subtle change in this piece is literally just to resize. And I know it sounds crazy just to say that as if nobody would think about it, but I cannot tell you how many times I've told somebody that when they're having this problem and they're like, oh, wow, I didn't ask them. I'm like, ask the customer, hey, I know you said you wanted a foot wide. Show them what a foot looks like on a real person. In fact, this is something I did very frequently, especially when we did uh, jacket back names. I did tons of letter jackets and awards jackets that had large single uh, 
last names on the backs of jackets. And they'd have somebody fairly small and say, I wanted a foot wide. And I would come in and I'd say, all right, I'm going to hand you this ruler, standard 12 inch ruler and had them hold it on my back. And my back is not small. And they saw that it's going shoulder blade to shoulder blade. I mean, I can certainly wear something with a 15 inch wide logo. I mean, that's possible, but we're starting to get into the curvature of the shoulders here. Most of the time they see it and go, oh, a foot's pretty big. And I'm like, I know it's not, you, you think you want it at a foot wide. The chances are 10, nine inches is perfectly fine. And you often don't see people wanting that. Now, when they do want it, obviously we can't handle that. That's not something that we can change by resizing. They don't want it small. You don't make it smaller. But if you never ask the customer, you might not be able to make that savings. Now, this is not a savings that would help with um, the hand of the garment at all. This is just literally shrinking down the design or a portion of it. But in working that out, it's something where you work with the customer and say, hey, here's the here is the actual deal that we can do. If you're cool with a little bit of art alteration, if you don't mind me getting to the art and design space of this thing, I'm going to resize this thing. It's just a small difference, 10% reduction, but I can save you. Hey, that was 15,000 stitches. If, if you were at the dollar a stitch that I always tell people not to size at, 15 bucks per execution. Or not 15 bucks. It was, uh, no, it was yeah, it was. It's 15,000 stitches. Uh, so yeah, it's like, that's a pretty massive change even when you're not pricing in any other sort of, you know, really, uh, yeah really kind of delicate way or right? actually i think that was uh was 89 never mind that was uh 13 but yeah still 13 bucks per piece that is a pretty big difference in budget if that's the big problem they might look at the piece and say all right do you want this piece for you want, want the you know the 70 70 thousand piece or the, the 90 dollar piece or this piece over here which one's working for you you know is it 70 something or is it 90 and how does that feel to you and it is entirely possible they look at you and say all right that inch of extra space just isn't worth that to me now the other possibility is if you have the client like i did and you show them what it actually looks like to replace some of that stitching with something else or to change some other stuff they might take it out and the other thing I'll say is part of that art alteration, let's just talk briefly about the Savage stuff, is that you can go back to them and say, all right, you made all, you have all these garments in a particular color. What if we change that garment color and then eliminate a color from the design itself? Like, let's just imagine that this person has decided that they want all of their garments in white. They weren't in this case, but let's say all the garments are in white. And we'll go ahead and go back out to our layout with the, the design up here. And then we say, all right, change them to light blue and drop the sky out and I'll drop some extra pieces out of this thing. And admittedly, I don't have all of this ready just to drop out. But now once again, we've dropped a decent, a decent amount of stitching. Is it enough to make the difference for them? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But that's another option. That's where we go into art alteration because here we are at 89. Here we are at 79. That's 10,000 stitches that I could pre you know, presumably drop out. And does it massively affect the look of a simple piece like this that has a big fill in it? Uh, it depends on the background. This is on black jackets. Yeah, we now have a night scene for our poor Roadrunner. But if it's on something where it makes sense, if we're going from white to light blue, or if we just tell them, hey, what if that was a, a, a bright sky? What if we're just going to make this white? It's background color. Talk to them about that. And that's one of those savage art design changes where it's like, man, you cut an entire color out. I'm like, yeah, I cut an entire color out, but I also cut that, you know, 10,000 stitches out of each one of these reproductions. That's, that is something that could be valuable enough to the customer for them to say, hey, yeah, I get it. It's something that's worthwhile. So like I said, it is one of those things that it could be worthwhile to your customer and it might not be. It might not be what they feel for it. But the truth of the matter is when we are dealing with this, it really is about that communication and saying, hey, you know, I don't want to have to do a savage cut to this piece, but if we can't hit that, how can I get you to where you're going? How can I get you on budget with the look you want or with the time we have? Because that's the other thing. Remember, stitch count is time on machine. That is really what that's about for us. We can talk about the other uh, creative sides of this. We can talk about the comfortability of wearing the garment and having a nice flowing hand, which I'm all about. But the truth of the matter is it's also time on the machine for us. And I'll say one of the problems I have personally with doing this is because I tend to go toward lighter densities. I tend to go toward longer stitch lengths and things like that. Uh, I often don't have that much room to give. And so I have to result to things like our uh, resize and replace and reduce kind of mentality. I have to go to other art alterations or dealing with other materials, because most of the time I've done the subtle stuff in the from the get-go, because I'm trying to lighten things out on my end from the beginning. So sometimes that can be problematic. 
Um, if you have the right customers and you're pricing on value, it might not be the thing that you deal with. You have people who are happier to pay for your value. That's the best kind of customer you can get. We all know realistically that sometimes that's not the case. But like I said, with time on machine, sometimes even when the customer is willing to pay, the real problem you're having is I have too many pieces and too little time. And if it's something that I can't sub out to a larger contractor that can do this on time, I now just have to do what is possible for the throughput of my machine and for the humans who are following them, you know, for the humans who are watching those machines. And that's something I'm actually going to show you fairly, uh, fairly soon. So we're going to talk about um, a piece that I did for the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta, where I really did have to do that stuff. And we're, like I said, we'll talk about that in a second. And I'll actually show you some more pieces of that design work, both in real stitches and in the file. But let's go ahead and go through one more of the kind of really subtle ways that we can handle this stuff. And uh, what I call this is going long. You got to go long. What do I mean by that? Uh, if you are currently using the defaults that were set up by your software, there is an entire chance that the stitch length for your fill stitches is a little short or is it at least not as long as it could be and still be viable. What do I mean by this? Uh, most software suites, and, and not all, are going to default your fill stitch length, whether that's tatami fill, whatever kind of fill stitch you're working on, your default fill stitch length will be somewhere between three and four mils, usually three to 3.5. And there is nothing wrong with that. A three millimeter fill looks nice and tight, keeps the surface nice and tight. Nothing wrong with that. However, personally for me, I find that I want a little bit longer fill stitch. And to me, it looks a little bit more like classic embroidery or the embroidery that I kind of uh, wanted to emulate when I first started digitizing the stuff that I saw punched by hand digitizers, stitch by stitch digitizers, punchers back in the day, they had a little bit longer stitch lengths. Um, certainly the machines ran slower way back in the day. And I think that's where they didn't have the same trouble that we might have. And I'll talk about that in a second, but I like to go a little bit longer with stitch lengths and longer stitches, of course, means less stitch count because we're covering more area without dropping the needle. So less times that we drop the needle is going to be less stitch count is going to be less time but we have to be very careful with how we do that. So what I'm gonna tell you is this, I like a four millimeter stitch length and I call that the Goldilocks zone. It's not like it's my term. People talk about that with uh, planets are in a Goldilocks zone if they're warm enough, uh, but not too hot so that they can support life. What I mean is it's not too short, it's not too long, it's just right. And why do I say that? Depending on your machine, your equipment, over four millimeters and some machines are going to start triggering a slower stitching method where they are slowing the entire machine down so they don't have quality issues or they're not you know lashing back and forth four millimeters is where some of those machines start is it all machines no uh, is that number exactly the same it does not seem to be and some people have said that it's longer or shorter Honestly, I haven't run every machine in the business. I don't know where that speed curve is. Some people have adjustable speed curves they've worked on. Suffice it to say, without working on anything more than just plugging something into your into your machine and stitching away, uh, there are machines that will start to slow down over that four millimeter length. So right close to that four millimeter length is where I like to keep my stitches. It's not going to cause the machine to trip into slow stitching mode, but it is going to be longer than that three millimeter length or 3.5 millimeter length that is by default. Like I said, nothing wrong with running that. I will run a flatter, shorter stitch. As you guys know, longer stitches are loftier. They stick up more from the surface that we're stitching on. Uh, shorter stitches tend to ride a little flatter. So a shorter stitch may look a little smoother to you. I find that that four millimeter zone is not too long. Uh, it's not so long it's going to snag, especially in a fill stitch. Remember, because we're offsetting those stitches brick wise, they are offset course to course. That means it's a little harder for something to snag under them, get into them. They're not likely to necessarily be abraded or rub off or tear up, but they're not that three millimeter stitch that's going to take longer to fill an area. So Goldilocks zone for me is the four millimeter stitch. I'm just going to show you a very brief uh, example of that. And here we are in Stitch Artist. And just to show you this, all this really is, these are uh, three blocks identical of stitching. These are uh, four inch, 100 millimeter actually blocks of stitching from side to side here. We'll go ahead and back those out. So we're looking at these blocks on the left hand side. We have a block that is made with a, th a three millimeter stitch at four points of uh, density. So 0.4 millimeter density, three millimeter stitch, and we're looking at 17,222 stitches. This does not have any underlay. So just to show you, there's no underlay being shown. This is just a standard fill style stitch. 
So tatami stitch, fill stitch, as you might see here, it's selected as tatami here. Um, that is 17,222 stitches. When I move over to 3.5 millimeters in stitch length, we're already at 14,800 stitches. So 17,2, 14,8. So we're already dropping, you know, we're dropping the, those thousands of stitches on the way here. And then when we go out to the four millimeter length, which is where I like to keep my stuff at, we're at 13,000 stitches. So that is a pretty mass change from 17,000 stitches down to 13,000 stitches. You know, we are talking about that 4K difference in that filled area. And that is literally just from a very small difference in stitch length. Your textures are not gonna be vastly changed. I mean, certainly you can see textural differences uh, between the two pieces a little bit, but honestly, you're not gonna see vast differences in texture. You're not gonna see vast differences uh, in the way these sew necessarily. Really all you're going to have is a lower stitch length and maybe a slightly uh, more raised setup, just a little bit more lofty than you would see in the three mil for my money, for my time, especially on jacket backs, which is where I got this from. Uh, when I was first starting uh, in this business, I had somebody who had punched this awesome uh, bomber jacket back and I loved the fill on it and it looked a little different from what I was used to. And the first thing I noticed was that my default settings in the original software that I was using were much shorter. The fill stitches were much shorter than the old school punchers used. And I went to that four millimeter stitch length and to be quite honest with you guys, I have never gone back. I mean, certainly textures can be a little different. It's hard to see on screen with a preview like this, but it's not different enough to cause the art to look different. So this is one of the best subtle ways that we can handle this stuff. Back out of those super short stitches and roll down to something that's a little bit longer. Uh, like I said, for my money, I like the three or the four millimeter. Uh, some folks I know really go for kind of the 3.8. They get right along the border because they may have uh, whatever machine they have does that slow stitching mode right at four. Uh, for folks who are having that issue, or let's say you're you're uh, dealing with this on a column instead of something else, satin stitches, four millimeters is pretty wide. I mean, people make them all the way close up to 10 with no problems. The thing is, um, that's a different kind of slow stitching mode. I'm just going to tell you there are multiple uh, speed curves in this or speed sets in this. And certainly I'm not talking about that super long, uh, once you get past 12, 12.4 millimeters, that super long ka-chunk, ka-chunk, double cycle stitch that we have when we're doing like say 3D foam with really long stitches. But there is a slower mode in between that you could kick off. Some of them kick right at four, some of them are right under. Uh, test on your machine and find out, or look and see if your machine has settings for that or has adjustable curves for speed. Uh, I don't know. I have heard from different people from machines that I don't know that they have different settings or different uh, abilities than the machines I was working on had. But when I first started doing this, this is where we kind of landed as that kind of Goldilocks zone. And I still stay a lot with that four millimeter stitch. To me, surface looks good, runs nice and fast. And I like the little additional loft. And I find the little bit of additional loft actually lets me play with density more too, because the more we lift off of that surface, kind of the better coverage I think we get. Uh, we're just kind of bringing that, bringing that top stitching away from the color underneath it a little bit uh, seems to make a difference to my eye. But your mileage may vary. Test it out for yourself. Do a swatch test. I'm always telling you guys about swatch testing. I'm going to bring it up again in a minute. Test swatches of different stitch lengths and see if you're happy with it. And listen to your machine. Watch it run and see when it slows down. Even if it's something you can't find in a manual, go through and do a set of swatches of fill stitch to get longer and longer. And when you hit the one that slows the machine down, you know where your line is. Make your stitches longer and longer by 0.2 mils until we get to that point. Do 10 swatches. One run of you know having to sit at the machine while you're doing this stuff is enough to teach you everything you need to know. One big panel of swatches, probably in a 15 centimeter hoop, is enough to teach you a lot about how your machine runs and how those fills are gonna look. We're gonna talk about that again, but yeah, go on. Uh, go for some, go for a little bit extra length in that stitch and it, check your defaults if they're at three, 3.5. Like I said, this is nothing that's wrong with the software. It's a nice, lovely stitch length, don't hate it, but I like a good four millimeter stitch and I think it makes a difference. And as you saw, going from three to four millimeters, we were like thousands of stitches on a four inch square. Now four inch square is a big piece of fill, but a lot of this is, when people are talking to me about this, a lot of it is about jacket backs that have large areas of filled color. And we can really reduce that down by lengthening some stitches and then working on, of course, the thing we are always working on, which is density. Oh, density. 
truthfully, this is where the swatch testing always makes its appearance whenever I discuss these things. Ultimately, it's hard not to talk about density in the, in this kind of place when we're discussing this stuff. Now, certainly I've got some stuff to show you about this. We'll bring up some my uh, gallery here. First off, here's a detail of that road run if you want to see it. I'm going to say looking at this piece from across the years, I probably could have worked on the density more. Um, though it was on a lot of contrasting materials, I think I probably could have dropped the density a little bit. And you can see this is that four in, or that four millimeter stitch length. So if this doesn't look outwardly too chunky to you, and this is uh, not, I would say necessarily the best on the density, I could have backed it off, then that's what you're looking for. That's the stitch length that I'm talking about. And honestly, the one thing you have to worry about, and I'll be patently very honest with it, you can kind of see the swoop of that curved fill in the body. I don't know why we're getting that weirdness in the uh, with the cursor, but you see how the body is curved here. The longer you make your stitches, unless it's going to do some reduction, and depending on your software, it might be different if it's got a minimum stitch setting, you might see a little bit of gapping in tightly curved fills. This is a nice smooth curve in the body and a nice smooth curve over the wing. Um, very simple rendition. I didn't do individual feathers on the top of the wing here. So this is a super, super graphical, simple rendition of this piece. It was brought into me as slab uh, vector colors. So I wasn't, I didn't go too crazy with trying to make this realistic. But what you might find is when you have a really tight, like even in the neck here, there actually is. And I think I can see just a little bit of what I'm talking about here. I don't think it detracts too much, but I'll, I'll tell on myself when you have this tight part of this curve here, if you see this very small amount of gapping that's happening here, um, longer fill stitch lengths will allow for some offset from row to row to end up with those gaps. Because as we know, there is no stitch that is curved. Um, every individual stitch is a line from point to point, and we build up curves out of small facets, small individual straight lengths, because that's what stitches are. And when those kind of have that interference right here where they don't quite line up in the curve, you can get small gaps. And here in the transition of this curve too, we have a very small gap. This is done on a heavy, uh, a black material that was very heavy and kind of coarse. So I think, honestly, I look at this piece and though it doesn't have everything I would like it to have and I can see changes I'd make, it looks pretty successful. But you can see that if you do use longer stitch lengths, the one thing to watch out for, the curved fill can cause some breakage uh, line to line, course to course. So that's something to look at, something to look forward to, uh, at least is to say, all right, I may have when I have high contrast combinations and really long stitch lengths, a little bit of chatter when I'm dealing with a curved fill. Other than that, if you look at the big flat slabs, I think it looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and back this out again. We're going to talk about some other stuff and there's plenty of things here, but let me bring up the old swatch test again. I know everybody's going to say, geez, Eric, you're going to show us this swatch test. Absolutely. I'm going to show you the swatch test again. First thing is this piece over here that we have that is uh, done in spun polyester. You can see that's just me testing to see when I hit coverage. This down here is the coverage that a 40 weight thread is usually supposed to have. Uh, this was a fuzzier thread. So you back up and you go well into the next row up and you're still getting nice coverage because it's a slightly thicker, slightly fuzzier thread. But this over here is standard black 40 weight polyester thread on a uh, kind of a khaki twill. And I was doing this for a project. I talk about this swatch test all the time. It was for a project where a bunch of different designs were on aprons. It had big filled areas. And I thought, you know, I don't think it really needs to have a, four, a 0 0.4 mil or a four point fill density, which is what's down here. If we back up a couple of different squares here, I looked at this square and said, you know what, this density here still looks good. I find this to be, a, you know, decent coverage over here. That's not too bad. This coverage over here, the stitch count of the bottom left-hand corner uh, is actually 18% less stitch count and density than we have on the bottom right-hand corner. And you can also see there's actually a little bit more uh, distortion on the bottom right as we get up to that top kind of 0.4 millimeter for embroidery point density. So checking out a swatch test like this can really help you to reduce your densities. And I think it's good for stitch lengths as well. In fact, swatch testing like this, like I'm showing you here, it really doesn't have to be for any one variable. If you're trying to find out anything about your stitches, uh, patterns that you want to lo look at. I've got pattern swatch tests that I've done many times for fills. Uh, different combinations of how close or how far things have to be on a particular material or how thick satin stitches should, should be on a material that maybe has some pile or maybe a heavier like sweatshirt that starts to sink in. The knit is allowing it to sink in and we're seeing a lot of pull compensation problems. 
run some zeros and X's, do Fox testing, but do it on that garment. And you can see how much your text is going to shrink down at relative uh, satin stitch widths compared to the kind of text you're going to run. Especially if you're going to make a lot of that garment, you're somebody like me who had a class of garments you ran all the time. Um, a lot of my work for companies was done with piquet polos. So I learned how to do piquet polos very well. But there were periods of time where I was making a lot of pieces on sweatshirts. So what did I do? Got out some sweatshirt material that was from the, the kind of sweatshirt I was going to run and did testing to see how much pull compensation it was pulling on the kind of text that I was going to use for uh, personalization. It's just a good idea if you're trying to get a frame of reference. So swatch testing is how we handle it. But swatch testing can be for so much. It can be for density. It can be for stitch length. It can be for uh, pull compensation. It can be for sequencing. Even if you're doing pieces that have multiple elements, you can do things with sequencing and play with that. The truth of the matter is, I think I'm just trying to tell you to test. And that testing doesn't always have to be uh, and in an entire design set, it can be density, it can be stitch length, it can be other things, but it can also be a test of how the fabric responds to different stitch types in general or other pieces. And it doesn't require you to create the whole design and test it. You can test smaller elements of the design or go down to stitch interactions. What does a fill and a satin stitch next to each other do when I put it on a heavy sweatshirt and they're both at this angle? That kind of testing is worthwhile. And I know we kind of get a general idea of these things, both from stuff that you might have learned uh, either directly or from folks like me and from things you've tested yourself, testing entire designs. I just want to kind of recommend that sometimes if you're just trying to figure out a situation and you can't get your head around it. Smaller swatches or self-directed small projects or elements that are similar to what you're going to do on the garment that you intend to run on can absolutely be instructional for the process. So like I said, it's a great concept. I, I think that it's something that everybody should try more. We have a couple of comments here too. Uh, Cindy says, uh, my BAS 415 has that slowdown spot. Uh, the BAS 415, I had one of those. If you guys don't know, that's a brother machine. But if you're picturing a plastic shelled, like uh, modern entrepreneur brother style machine or baby lock style machine. It is not. Uh, the BAS 415 is back when brother had lovely metal commercial machines. And I ran a ton of work on my very favorite little machine, which was a BAS 415 back in the day. Uh, so yeah, and it very much does have that slowdown spot in it. And I'm, I have to say, I don't remember that it was right at that four mil spot, but I'm sure it wasn't far off. Uh, we have a couple other things here where Barb says, great advice, uh, checking on stitch lengths on swatches. Yeah, try it out. Stitch lengths, settings, stitch types, and how they behave. Different underlays under the same setting. The one thing I will say is this, if you're doing swatch testing, for my, my time, uh, the best way to do it is to change only one variable at a time. So if you have that set of swatches, like I'll bring that back up, not like you necessarily need the visual, but if you have a set of swatches like this, when you're looking at this piece, I'm not changing the stitch length and the density and the underlay style on every one of these squares. We have the exact same underlay style, the exact same stitch length and the stitch angle on every one of the squares. So we haven't changed the pattern, the angle or the length. All I'm changing is the density. Um, certainly the thing is you could also say, say we like this coverage here. So middle square, second to bottom row. Say we like that coverage there. We could then make a grid of this piece and change the density of the underlay on each one. And now we would have a swatch test that had to do with how underlay behaves. And that would give us yet another kind of variable to play with. Say, all right, I'm pretty happy with this coverage, but could I tweak it one way or the other? I could do one strip and just move the underlay a little bit higher on that strip until I get to a coverage that I love. And now I've got uh, two kind of density settings I can use. And like I've always said to you guys, the density that causes the most distortion and rippling is when we keep on stacking stitches all in the same angle. When we have all of our stitches in the same angle until they're starting to roll off each other, that's how we get that massive push distortion and density problems there. What I would say is we want to add the density in the underlay to kind of compensate for that. So once we get where we're close to where we want here, we check out our underlay and make sure that it's doing its job and we can actually increase density in that underlay and it's not stacking stitches together at the same angle. It's laying underneath it at a different angle, but still covering, causing color coverage, causing it to lift up from the surface and helping out. And those kind of tests can be very useful. Like I said, it can help you learn a fabric very well. And as uh, Barb says, I need to do some swatch testing on knit fabric. Uh, yeah, knits were a real pain when I first started out, right? I mean, and, and honestly, 
I come from an era where the first stuff we did, the most stuff we did were fairly heavily textured cotton pique shirts. That was a lot of what I did early on. And so I had to learn how to get uh, cotton pique to hold up. And I'm also going to say this, guys, that also means uh, support materials. The other thing you can do is with or without topping, with or without a certain kind of stabilizer. I think that doing testing is important. And yes, it's material intensive sometimes. Yes, it's time intensive. But once you dial in your settings and materials, it means that the next job is just going to go better. And I honestly, there's nothing I can say about that aside from who doesn't want their job to be uh, dialed in and work well. So, you know, it's like that. So it really just depends on what you're into. So it, it is just a worthwhile thing to do. Also, I'm seeing lots of people talking about donating to good causes. That's great. Um, it's great to give back community, JC says, but sometimes people want something for nothing at the day everything costs. Yeah, you know, honestly, people need to need to understand that it should be value for value. Um, I give back where I can. As a digitizer, I've made lots of pieces for nonprofits. And honestly, that was part of what I used to do is say, um, even in my company, even though it wasn't, I was not uh, the owner of the company, I would often say, hey, if they can pay for the work and you're will you as the boss, you're willing to do that at cost or something of that nature. So you're covering what you need to cover. I will go home and digitize this, or I will clock out and digitize this piece and save them the setup fees. And that's fantastic to do. But yeah, nonprofits are a great place to do it. Um, it's wonderful. But uh, at the same time, it can be hard if they aren't doing it the right way. And I understand that. Uh, you should never feel pressured just because it's a nonprofit. If you are living hand to mouth by your embroidery and the nonprofit comes to call, hey, tell them, you know, at this moment, I can't do that. When I do better, I love to. But it is well worth it to be honest to people and say, you know, I, if you want me to be here to do the second run of these things, I'm going to have to be paid for it. And that's fair. Um, you are providing value. You are spending your time. You have purchased the equipment. And you are spending time learning. And I know that because you're here with me today. But it's hard. Yeah, uh, Barb says she donates for raffles, local fundraising events, good causes. Absolutely do it. I think that's fantastic. Donating good causes in your character. Same here. I've done a lot of it. And hey, I may or may not host a few different live shows for uh, the embroidery community. So I do try and give up a little bit of my time for you folks too. <laughs> I'm not saying you guys are charity cases. I'm just like you. That's how I started. I needed help and it wasn't there when I needed it back in the day. So I'm hoping that if I teach somebody something that saves them some time, that they'll have a better time and not be uh, banging their head against the wall and waiting for somebody to save them. And Honestly, back in the day when I did all of this by trial and error, I wish somebody could have told me, hey, man, your stitch links are too small. It's going to look weird. <laughs> My first cap, I ran the smallest stitch links you can imagine. I had fills that had two millimeter stitches in them. They were just absolutely little pockmarked fills that were super dense. Embarrassing to think about. But I started out with no concept of what was going on. And when I made the fills and they looked choppy, it looked like something was going on with stitch length and I had nothing to work from. So until I learned uh, how to analyze other folks' files that we had from back in the day, from old punchers, the people who were, that their stuff was converted over from paper tapes, frankly, uh, I learned how to analyze. I taught myself everything from that analysis originally and from just trial and error testing. But if something I can tell you or something you guys can tell each other, save somebody some time, then we have come together as a community and done something good today. Because uh, we're all people who need help too, right? All right. So let's go through some other stuff before we finish up for the day. We've got a few things to talk about, right? We talked about that going long Goldilocks zone. We talked about density and swatch testing. We talked a very little bit about structural underlay. But like I said previously, um, it really is about knowing when to add stitches underneath instead of in your top stitching. Yes, we're talking about structural underlay here. Uh, you guys have seen me show... Uh, multiple versions of underlay before, but yeah, knowing that underlay plays a part certainly is worthwhile and adding structure underneath the piece. And what I mean by structure is knowing that our stitch angle on top needs to be opposed by a stitch angle in the underlay so that the underlay lays on top of that or the top stitching lays on top of the underlay structurally and it does a real job. It's not just more stitches to cover the ground. It is something that is building up a functional uh, a functional foundation. That's something worthwhile to think about, certainly. So structural underlay is part of that. And like I said, I'm gonna show you some other stuff in the art and design phase in just a second. But really we wanna think about more than that, right? So structural underlay is great. Density is great. These are all fantastic ways to handle it, but we can also make some larger changes. And one of the easiest ones, certainly I always call, I call it the section in my upcoming article, apply yourself, it's applique. 
if you can get somebody to agree to applique, and I mean, this can be contentious, so I'm going to talk about it. Uh, if you can get a customer to agree to applique, of course, you're getting a massive change. Um, and certainly, like I said, structural underlay and the rest is great. I, I've often shown, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and show you an under, another underlay piece before I get through with it. Um, using underlay that does provide a real structure. Uh, zigzag underlay can be great under some satin stitches, but when they get super, super wide or they have texture in them like this auto split satin, sometimes they don't do their job. Building your own contour underlay that is very structural and holds things up can be very valuable. But ultimately, there is a limit to what you can do, whereas applique can make a big difference. The thing is, there can be some kind of contention about it, both in the look of the applique uh, and in the fact that not every piece is really made for it or there can be a trade-off. When we get to a certain size, there can be a certain, it depends on different pieces. You get to a certain size where uh, the applique that you're going to use, the replacement of the stitches is so small that the time spent cutting and placing gets close. Now, if you're in jacket back territory, I don't see that happening that often. I've had tons of people say, nope, applique takes more time than stitching, forget it. Here are my kind of arguments against that. So why do I, I still say, hey, apply yourself, try some applique and applied materials. Number one, there's more than one kind of applique and we're talking about it, but right now we're talking about traditional twill. Here's why I kind of fight this concept that no, man, the cutting takes so long. The chief thing we're usually trying to save here is time on the embroidery machine. The time on the embroidery machine is embroidery production time. And if we save a ton of that, it can be where either um, the operator can do cutting. That's what I often did. You could actually be the person who's also cutting applique. You can be using pre-ordered appliques that you factored into the price. And the difference is, you know, it is still generally a stitch savings, especially on large size pieces, especially on jacket backs with big filled areas. And uh, not only that, sometimes if it's the production time that is the most important to us, let's just say, okay, yeah, there's cut time, but while I'm cutting or while cut time is being done, or if I hired that stuff out, I'm still able to run other work on this piece. Yes, it does kick out the, the hoop. We have to stop for a second. We have to place all our applications. We have to make sure they run correctly. Go ahead and calculate it. Sometimes it really is about that runtime. And if you are concerned about runtime on the machine, go ahead and calculate it. Most of the time when I have been running really large jacket pieces that I'm using big appliques to uh, cover up, it is not even close. The time spent zigzagging down the applique, making sure, and honestly, to even stopping to kind of take a look and make sure things are good. When we're talking tens of thousands of stitches versus uh, laying that in place and running it, somebody who's experienced and has cuts that are easy to line up, the chances are it's just not that long. Um, now, I know there's other arguments for it. Somebody is going to come to me and say, nope, it doesn't work. It's always longer for me. It takes longer or I'm hand cutting them, which is a, a difference for certain uh, or that you don't have that factored into price in that way. So you're trying to make that work at the same price. Honestly, I think it's not something that we're usually doing for reducing overall price. Sometimes that price is a wash because we now have materials involved. We now have cutting involved if we're subcontracting the cutting that might come down to the point where it's the same cost in the end to the customer. But even if it's the same cost in the end to the customer, but it provides us with more machine time and the piece is less stiff, that's still a win for me for most pieces. Now, this doesn't mean we always just go putting, you know, untreated applique on everything. Uh, not everybody's going to like the look. Depending on the applique material you, material you use, you may have different shine. It could be shinier or less shiny than the other piece, you're, than the pieces you're working on that are fully embroidered. They might not like the texture. And then we have to kind of balance it, especially traditional twills. But at the same time, when it is something that's acceptable to a customer, they like the look. It really can save you a lot of time. And like I said, on big jacket back pieces, I've had such massive changes that it's hard to argue that to me. Uh, like I said, is there a world in which the cutting time is onerous to you? If you are the only person running, uh, you cannot run the machine while you cut. It's in different locations. You don't have a cutter of any kind, so you're hand cutting. You can't figure price in, to, in some way where you can buy the cuts from someone who does cuts. I perfectly understand that it might not work for you. I would endeavor to say most folks should time it once, literally get on the machine, put the timer down, say, this is the time I spent cutting. This is the time I spent 
uh, in stitching. And here's what it would have taken me. If you know, of course, how many stitches per minute your machine can run, you can very easily calculate the difference between that time for my time, for my money. Um, certainly I have appreciated that applique was worthwhile. And I've got a couple of older pieces that I have here just to show you what I'm talking about. Also, because there's other things that it can save aside from just stitch count, but let me just bring this back in here. Um, for my time, for my money, a piece like this. This is Desert Dog Racing. Um, the sample on this piece, this is traditional uh, twill, but this is a PS Poly twill from Stalls. It's fairly shiny. Customer liked it, but uh, the Desert Dog piece that you're looking at here, fairly large. We're talking probably a, a 10 inch wide circle on this piece. This is a three color applique that these are cut right to the line, but we have nice wide, about five millimeter satins doing full cover edges on these pieces. The amount of stitching saved here is phenomenal. You cannot tell me that this is going to take the same amount of time. Do I have to do the placement? Yes. Uh, Pre-cuts with PS Poly 12, they were cut on a regular drag knife cutter. Uh, the art was easy to deal with. This is not super complicated art. We have three slabs of color. They fit in together very easily. And using the PS12, Poly 12, the PS stands for pressure sensitive, meaning it was sticky. So uh, it, this means it sticks down like a sticker when you pull it off the carrier sheet. So cut on a regular vinyl cutter with a 60 degree blade. Um, it sticks down like a sticker when you place it. So I put all my placement lines down. I stuck all three colors down and tacked them down uh, with, I believe with black on the inside and red on the outside. So it works out that everything got tacked down in two runs. There's one extra color change and this versus filling a 10 inch circle on your back, uh, your jacket back. I cannot see the argument that that's not going to save you some time. Uh, and also I'm going to say, is it amended? Yes. Uh, the internal pieces of the mouth here, we've got these individual stitches uh, or satin stitch card teeth. We have satin stitch borders. We have a fill stitch in the tongue because we're on top of the gray slab. I wasn't trying to cut little bitty pieces. I did limit the amount of difficulty that I was going to have on the piece and not all art will allow you to do that. But this particular art, and I keep on flashing that Gilly Loco, sorry about that. Um, this piece, the original art is fairly simple. It's got big slabs of color. It's just a good candidate. So even though I tell you, yeah, use applique, you got to know when it's not a good candidate. Not every piece is a perfect candidate for applique. This piece is a great candidate, especially because you talked to the customer, I showed them a sample of what that applique looks like. And this customer said, yeah, that looks cool. You know, I'm showing them and I think I've got some roll stock here and I'll show you some other pieces I worked on in a second. But yeah, I'm showing this roll stock and I didn't, I didn't bother trying to show them necessarily a bunch of designs. I said, this is the material we're going to use for it. This is my roll stock. This is an old school pick of a bunch of uh, CAD cut. I said, PS Poly 12. I'm like, this is what it's going to look like. And I did have a sample in a sample book that just showed them a small design with a, uh, with a covered edge and said, that's what it's going to look like. And honestly, the other time I've used it, used it that it was on kind of a fine material. And even I was a little questioning when I first did it, uh, were these papal banners. I've showed you these guys these many times. Uh, the two central colors on this, these are both done with that same PS Poly tool on these large banners. Uh, frankly, for something that had some luxury to it and the whole concept for it look a little bit luxurious, um, the, the customer was very happy with the applique in that piece. And it looked quite nice on all the different samples. You'll see there's a little bit of rippling here. Um, honestly, doesn't show as much in the real world. Shows more under flash photography than it did uh, hanging up. But even with that small amount of rippling, I would say the one thing to watch out for is you may want to tack these with tack irons and that does add time. So something that does have a lot of embroidery that's going to be in and on the actual surface, you might see a little bit of that looseness and a tack iron might help that. Or if you can pre-press uh, pieces, that's not something that's easy to do on an in-hooped piece like that, but it might help a little bit to do some tack iron work. Suffice it to say though, on a really large central piece and on this piece, like I said, the, uh, the desert dog piece, that was not pre-tacked. That was not that way. Do we see a little bit of texture in it? Absolutely you do. But it did, uh, I did really cover a large area and it looked very good and the customer was real happy with it. Now, the other thing I'm gonna say is, uh, also there's all kinds of non-traditional applique we might use. Um, I have showed you guys this Gilly Loco piece many times, but this is one where uh, originally the art had a tremendous amount of shading and craziness in the background to try and look like a, a textured skin, a reptile skin. And I went ahead and used their standard PS Poly tool applique under the Gilly Loco portion. And in this piece, we have actually, it's an upholstery material that was used as an applique that had a faux uh, snakeskin kind of pattern on it or, or a crocodile pattern on it probably. And uh, this piece, really, it was harder to cut than I would like on a drag knife. If I would have had a laser, I'd been a lot happier, but it's something that worked out. But the thing is, once again, 
This stitch count reduction, the reason why we did this, I had to do a bunch of pieces pretty much in a 24 hour period big jacket backs that had to go out for an event and they didn't know what, what they were going to do to get it done. And they came to us last minute. We charged more than what we would have charged for full fill stitches in this case, but we were able to create something very interesting. And we managed to crank out like a couple dozen jackets very quickly with massive coverage because we used applique to make that happen. Is there still stitching? Yeah. Inside the Gilly Loco text, inside the salsa banner here. And of course there's tons of stitch details all the way around. However, we do get to use this for the really large areas of the film. Now, do I think that there could be something better done with some of this? Absolutely. A little bit of cover texture of stitches would have worked, but I was trying to reduce as much stitch count as possible for a time savings. So at this point, that's a time savings issue. One of the other ways we use applique, same thing. I've told you this uh, before with uh, performance materials. This was actually a piece done for uh, Duke City, Ready Mix Concrete. These, these folks wanted to have the uh, this full logo on the back of a garment. Now, I was like, man, this really isn't a great plan. You're trying to have this full fill. And they're like, nope, it's got to be a full fill. We don't want any sort of uh, applique or material or printing on it. And what I produced for them and presented them was this. And what you're looking at is an applique with a less than 50% density fill over the top in a matching color. And that applique reduced the amount of stitching that was there, made it quicker to run, cheaper to run, and lighter on the garment. And overall made this piece not be incredibly heavy in distorting the back of this mesh shirt. Is this the most comfortable thing? No, this is absolutely a compromise, but this is a compromise between the customer and me about what is possible for their brief. The brief is, I want this mesh polyester shirt and I want it with a full, fully embroidered back on the ja like jacket back size back across the yoke. I want it full, fully filled and to look like complete embroidery. And the best option I could give them was, let me put an applique under it. It's going to reduce the amount of distortion in the piece and it's gonna be a little less heavy as far as how much stitching is gonna go through the, the actual piece. Does it still have more stabilizers than I love on a shirt like that? Absolutely. Was it what they wanted to a T in the end? I say yes. They were happy with the look. They were happy with the texture. Is it something I would recommend you do on sportswear all the time? No. Those small appliques can be useful. The thing is, then they're less about cost savings and they're more about the quality of the piece or the wearability of the piece. And that's something that I think is worth kind of looking at is that sometimes we have things that we're doing and they're not about cost savings. They're more about making sure we have the right kind of look. And I mean, that's one of those things that we kind of have to say is like the look and the wearability are important. And it's one of the ones that I talk about, like one of the pieces I've actually shown before and I don't have the uh, photo up, but I do have the design. And this is where we start getting into, uh, you know, the, the area of is this worthwhile or not? Um, on a piece like this, we have a fairly small logo. It's a left chest logo. We are at a little over three inches in width. Does this make sense to have this piece? Well, what does this allow for me? Why would I use applique here? Once again, I'm on a light polyester material. It's on a black shirt or a dark shirt. If I want to get full color coverage, this applique can help me get full color coverage without having any sort of gaps or looseness or show through. And as you can see here, I have got this really fine uh, kind of native pattern that's happening here because we've got this from the San Ildefonso people. You know, we were, we were out Pueblo style. So we're trying to do something that they brought in that's got this kind of uh, this really tight patterning that goes on in this band. And it has these really thin straight stitch lines. And to make that look good, uh, running that on an applique is a much better option for us than running that uh, on a full fill stitch. Cause now we're talking about the grain of the fill stitch potentially um, causing some issues with these really fine lines. Now, would it run okay? Sure, is it, but is it better and easier to get small text that's got some distortion to it to get uh, this really fine lines and the nice patterns to run? Uh, absolutely it was. And if I can bring that up, I can also try and bring you guys up that uh, image in a second. But for sure, um, it's not it's not as easy to get on a fill as it is on a piece. Now let me go ahead and actually show you the image. I've got the uh, photograph of the piece as well. This is what it looks like on the garment. And you can see I've got really nice, clean, fine lines, really nice, clean, small text. And it looks good sitting up on the piece patch style, but with a fully embroidered border that makes it look more integrated. In that case, are we reducing stitch count? Yeah, absolutely. The stitch count for that fully filled circle in the background would be an issue. But 
the thing that we're really getting out of this is reduced distortion and reduced kind of heaviness on the garment. Because the other thing you can do, I didn't on this piece, but you can, uh, and I have on some of the pieces like this, is pre-embroider this piece ahead of time. So we've got this central area is all pre-embroidered patch style. We cut it out, uh, whether we're doing that by hand or a hot knife or laser or hey, clicker, whatever you have. If you've got a clicker for a certain circle size, you could do that too. Um, when we cut that piece out, we can then actually place it like a, an applique and edge it on the garment after embroidery. And then no embroidery is through this piece except for the edge. So that's another option we can do. And once again, this is, yes, stitch count redu reduction, but it's also just improving the wear of the garment and the feel of the garment overall. And I think that's something that's still valuable. Like, like I said, it's not just all about um, making this thing cheaper for a customer or for ourselves, but it is something we can do. Uh, the other one I want to bring up is rip away applique. Uh, if you have heat transfer capability in your shop, rip away applique isn't just for glitter flake. I'm going to show you glitter flake because it's what I have on hand to show you. But I've seen some really impressive rip away applique done with standard heat transfer vinyls. And the cool thing is, if you have a nice border on these pieces, and I'm going to show you a piece that one of my uh, one of my readers actually shared with me to share in an article and one of my own pieces. You have a nice border on that. Those can almost have a leather-like look. The shine and texture, when combined with embroidery over or embroidered borders, can sometimes create a leather-like look. So, like a colored leather out of the um, out of the regular heat transfer vinyl. Or you can do things like glitter. Hey, if glitter is your bag. You want to get shiny? We'll get shiny. Right, that's something we can do. Uh, but let me go ahead and show you what I'm talking about. Rip away applique is where we place a heat transfer vinyl over the area that we're going to stitch. We stitch in our full density borders. And when we're done, we tear away the excess and we heat press it for final fusion. And you might say, all right, that, that looks kind of crazy to me. But like I said, you can use standard applique uh, or standard heat transfer vinyl colors for this. You take it off the carrier sheet, you lay it down fully over the area. And generally, you're not having to glue that down on these big flat pieces. You might want to use some light adhesive or something. I assume you might. I've never had to, so I'm just going to say I never really uh, thought of it as a critical thing to deal with. I believe I've got a couple of my pieces in here as well, and I might have uh, omitted them. Oh, here we are. So here's a couple of my pieces. This is uh, this is one that I actually sublimated first, so it's a full color sublimated on uh, white glitter vinyl. So we're at white uh, glitter flake that the glitter flake itself is made of polyester. So it takes sublimation. So I sublimated full color uh, chilies for this ABQ design. And actually without changing the design or any of the digitizing on that piece, I also made this one that has a balloon fiesta logo or a balloon fiesta photo within that piece with metallic thread. So, hey, if you threaded up the same needle on two heads, you could actually do both of these at the same time and it wouldn't matter whatsoever. But these pieces were, uh, these are pre-sublimated to get that full print look, uh, but you could certainly use any sort of uh, print and heat press material. If you have material that is printed, maybe if, if you have like solvent printer that does the same kind of thing, we can just use heat press material and tear it away. And then there's no cutting. And this is another stitch, uh, stitch reduction technique. Also, you can do this kind of work where you stitch through it. I don't know that it's something I've seen done a lot, but you can stitch through it. I've seen people do it. Uh, it does tear, so you have to watch out. You're doing a ton of like really sharp satin stitches over the top. It can tear away before it gets fused. So be careful about that, but especially simple pieces like this where you have a nice big border and we're intending to tear that extra area away. Um, heat transfer vinyl, rip away applique is a valid way to uh, cover areas. So we can essentially do a print and then cover. Could you do screen print or something else? Yes, the difference with this between uh, doing like screen print or sublimating and then embroidering around it is, this is a zero registration issue. You slap it down in the area of where it's going to go. You stitch over it, tear away the excess. If you're doing either traditional applique like you see in these pieces, um, that's going to mean you're at least putting a placement line down, and then you're having to carefully align a cut piece on, uh, inside those lines. So there's a little bit of alignment. If you print first, it means your hoop alignment has to be good, or you have to be using, uh, there are, uh, embroidery machines, especially more in the home side right now that have the ability for you to very easily turn designs. Some commercial machines do it. The older commercial machines that I often am helping people with and ran myself did not have the ability, especially not with computer vision, to be realigning things and targeting. And it meant that you had to do very careful hooping to do multimedia where we were dropping something onto a pre-printed garment. So that is a harder thing to do. But when we're doing this stuff 
or like I showed you in this bottom piece, these are actually, um, these prints are full bleed around the outside edge. I didn't put those pictures in the, in the deck, but these are full bleed and that does not have to be very carefully aligned. And especially when you're doing this in a single color, um, like we showed earlier with this piece that uh, my reader very nicely let me show, um, these pieces don't have to be aligned at all because it's just one big slab of color when we go ahead and go uh, wider than the entire piece very simply. And like I said, it's just another option for taking out a color because you could do this. We're showing it as the entirety of the coverage here, but you can easily imagine how even on another design, if you had a big slab of color inside of a design that was bordered like that, it'd be fairly easy to make it integrated into a further design, provided we realize that it can tear and we don't do a ton of very small uh, detailed work inside of it without watching for that tearing, because this can tear while you're running, just like any sort of plasticky substance may when we're using it. Like we do, we have to worry about when we're doing plastic for patches, like we have to worry about if we're doing something that has um, a topper. Toppers will tear away with more and more work on top of them too. Mostly for toppers, that doesn't matter so much, but we might find that they get less effective as we tear them up. So it's just something to think about. So like I said, some, some interesting things that we can do for sure. So like I said, it's an easy way to add color. Letty says it too. Yeah, such an easy way to add color. Absolutely. Um, and it actually looks pretty good as that applique. I love big applique text with that look. It's not a bad look. And like I said, try it with normal heat transfer vinyl. And it looks, it can have a leathery appearance. I saw this person, I wish I had a photo of it still, um, who did this wonderful kind of, they had a big navy sweatshirt with a beautiful set of gold lettering on the front. So lovely contrasting colors. And they used standard heat transfer vinyl with borders like that. And it just looked so awesome. It popped so much. It Because it was a little bit uh, on the on the spectrum of, of like Trapunto, where this heavy sweatshirt was kind of puffing up inside of the borders. And with it transitioning from the uh, to rougher texture of the sweatshirt to the shine of that heat transfer material, it had this very leather applique look that was just like perfect. It looked very nice. So it's something worth worth trying out, and I'd love to see it. But yeah, a lot, lot, of, lot of great stuff there too. Um, but I, I absolutely with uh, <laughs> Cindy on this, when, when you learned you only had the magazines to read and find out everything, I started without the magazines and then found a magazine in a drawer at the shop and realized it was possible. And then I subscribed to every magazine I could. And then I started writing for them and wrote for them. Oh, wait, that's right. I'm still writing for them <laughs> since since uh, 2006. I've been writing for magazines and blogs for the industry. So yeah, magazines are a good place to go and uh, why I write for those. And sometimes with very little remuneration uh, or none is because uh, honestly, I, I found some of my great in, early inspiration in the magazines too. Uh, Jorita gives us a little note on stitch length. And densities, uh, she says, trial and error, I found my scenery looks more realistic, about 4.3 density and 3.9 to 4.1 length. Still working on the underlay part. Yeah, blending works very well. And also you can play with uh, stitch length with blending. You're trying to blend two colors. Uh, the shorter lengths tend to want to sink in a little bit. We can kind of bring things to the forward a little bit. Is it subtle? It's very subtle, but you can totally play with stitch lengths and, and uh, densities to get really good blending uh, kind of effects to work on. I do love that stuff. By the way, uh, hi, Jesse. Thank you for being a supporter and being here all the time. I like to call you out when you say hi. Uh, but we have a couple more things to talk about before we finish up. We'll try and keep them pretty short. We're going to talk about a little bit of the art and design stuff real quick. So the art alterations, this is where it's savage. We're going to make some big changes to your art. And I'm going to talk about those and just kind of give you some concepts. Um, certainly one of the easiest things we can do is to just eliminate excess or work down from the original piece into something that is more accessible, that has less stitches in it. And the easiest, easiest way I've found is if you find a style that you can work with where a lower color count or where eliminating filled areas is something that's valuable to the style. And I've actually done it a few different times for different reasons. Uh, two I'm going to show today are very similar, but we have a couple of them. This is a piece that was done for Neons. I've shown it many times before. It's a very early piece of mine, but we actually went two directions with this one. Uh, had an original fully colored uh, jacket back here and we work on a single color piece. And in fact, I believe this one actually went the other direction, but here's the thing. You can go either direction. If we had a fully colored piece like this and we pitch them that if you've got a piece that's got full borders, full detail, has shading, has everything else, but when we drop out all the colored fills, we still have all of this character to it, 
you can pitch people on a single color version. And I know you're like, man, that's drastic. They came and wanted this full color, but you bring in the single color and you're like, all right, but it's a classic style that's interesting. One of the other places that I used it, what I would say to good effect, and we've got some other, other options here to show you. Here's a piece that I did for Al Unser Racing Museum. And so this is the original piece for Al Unser. Uh, not a bad piece at all, pardon me. <laughs> Having some slowdowns with uh, with uh, StreamYard today, so some of the clicking is come happening after I've already clicked, so you'll have to forgive me when things are going bad. Uh, but this is the piece from Al Unser, and we can see that it originally had some fill work. Most of it was open work, so this is already a pretty light piece because they intended it to be um, very much, it was, it was kind of like this, you know, uh, Margaritaville style shirt, this kind of, you know, Cuba Veras is what we used. If you don't know Cuba Vera, it is like the Cuban style shirts. So they had some light stitching on them and they wanted to go on these fairly light shirts, but then they had this big filled area with the text that had full shadowing in it. And the driver had, of course, fill. We have Al Unser here with some fill in it, but it has the classic Zia and all the stuff you expect from uh, a New Mexico institution. However, when we're looking at this piece, nothing wrong with it, but it's pretty heavy on the top end. And they wanted to do some classic kind of mechanic shirt setups. And I said, all right, classic mechanic shirt. I got you. Let's pull that stitch count down drop out that extra color. And then you'll see there's actually some changes that are done here though. Um, I opened up the shadowing and took shadowing out and made a larger border and open a, a larger open area around the text for Al here so that it was a little clearer and looked better. Does this change the look of the piece? Absolutely. I call that savage because I cut all the fill out of there. Is there anything wrong with that piece? Absolutely not. And it's thousands and thousands of stitches. You wouldn't think it's that much, but when you were talking about a massive tatami fill cover with a little bit of shading in it and the full cover shadow that's in here, uh, it absolutely made a difference. And of course, these pieces are also a bunch of curved fills and shading. Is it a ton of stitching? No, it's not a tremendous amount of stitching, but is it a, a mass savings overall? I would say yes. It's a pretty good savings overall. And honestly, it's something where they were pretty happy with the final result. And like I said, stylistically, on the mechanic style shirts, uh, going with this super classic single color look is something that is pretty awesome. It looks good on an old school mechanic shirt. So this is not a modern racing shirt with color blocking and all of that. This is an old school uh, work shirt, single color that's got, it also had a uh, single color logo and personalization on the front and it works stylistically with the piece. And the other thing we had for that, that's a very similar kind of thing. Um, in this case, I don't know if I want to call it art alterations as much. Uh, it was where I was doing a piece for a, a, a body shop called Alderson's, and they brought a picture and they're like, man, we really want to put this really cool car in the back of our jackets. And I look at this piece and go, yeah, we can do it. Here's something similar. Here's your stitch count. Here's your cost. And everybody's eyes blow open, right? It's like, that's, that is a large amount of stitching. That is a larger cost than we thought for work jackets. These guys are going to literally work in and beat up. And I'm like, all right, well, you guys are doing this really cool kind of classic 50s style. Once again, I went back to that early automotive embroidery or that kind of chain stitch embroidery of that era. Think the old school bowling shirts. Think that kind of stuff where less color, more shape, especially because it's hand guided. We're not we're not into this era of doing all of these massive multicolor embroideries. And I said, all right, well, we'll take a look with your actual pieces. We're going to take a look at your art. But ultimately, what you want here is probably not all that viable. So what did we get from them? This is back in the bad old days. So we got a scan out of a magazine. So I'm, this is what they hand me. And they're like, I want this on the back of, of the jacket. And I'm like, all right, so we got a custom car, scan out of a magazine. Uh, resolution's not great, but it's good enough. You know, it's fine. Um, we can see all of our edges. We're doing great. So none of this is going to really kill me, but you know, beautiful old Chevy, I believe <laughs> my dad's going to kill me because my dad's a mechanic. He knows better. Um, but yeah, beautiful. That might be an Oldsmobile or something. Gods. I don't know. I don't know. You guys tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know this model. My model uh, knowledge ends at like 57. <laughs> so I don't really know. I could be totally wrong, but beautiful old classic car done custom. Somebody's going to tease me later that I didn't know that. But here's what we ended up doing for them. I'm like, all right, you guys want it. And they wanted these big kind of black jumpsuit style things and, and very Carhartt-like thick cotton duck jackets. And they were all old school. So I was like, all right, we'll do something like this. Now, that we didn't end up doing a patch for them, but this was the style. I'm like, all right, then full outline style. Let's go totally hollow. We just do outlines. We do a little bit of texture work. So don't get me wrong. There's some texture work. We've got some carving in here. We've got some overlap pieces. We've got some, you know, there's some overlapping satins done here in the wheels. We've got some stitch angle work. I've got a nice split satin defining 
uh, the bumper. We've got some trim work that's done in overlapping satins, but we really reduced it down to its base elements and said, all right, yes, I know you pre presented me with this big full color photograph. And yes, I could make a full color photographic piece. I mean, I could make something that looks more like this. I could certainly go and make you this piece if you want it. We can do something that has a little more shading in it. I can make something that's got more to it. But if you're trying to go with that style and you're trying to reduce that kind of cost down and get the stitch counts down, but still have a really wide, large coverage area, absolutely we can do it. Let's go with this for Alderson's. And honestly, paired it with a cool kind of a left chest piece that was like this. It was similar and kind of had that same feeling. We also had a version where we had a full satin version of that same text for them to try out. And ultimately we did a, a, a number of these and they really liked them. So is that a mass change from what they brought us? Yeah, but what it was was a discussion. Uh, you come in with this and say, here's what we want. And I'm like, all right, well, I can do something like that. Here's what it's gonna cost you. Here's the stitch count you're looking at. And then they say, well, here's the style we're looking for. And we start to have this conversation about what it can be. And the savage cut is they didn't get a full color embroidered car in the back of all their work jackets. Uh, the thing that's nice about it though, is in the end, they got something that met their style and was cool and did the job. It's advertising the company. It shows what they do. It has the car they were trying to show on the back of it. It looks mean and it honestly has a lovely difference to, uh, you know, some of the commercial stuff that's out there now and looks more like something classic. So we had a stylistic excuse for it, right? There was a reason for that to change. And I think that's fine. You can make that reason. Nobody knows what it's supposed to look like till it's done. So you and the customer can have that discussion. And the other thing I'll tell you about is we had, I've done this for a lot of low stitch pieces, right? I've had that same kind of conversation. You guys, I've done this low stitch kind of discussion before about different stitch count stuff. I'm showing you some of the similar stuff, but um, some of the other things I've done like this, there's another piece that you guys know, I gave a version of this away uh, a couple of 4th of July ago. You can still go get this right now on brilliance.com if you want it. Um, this Trapunto design was done for, a, a bunch of stuff going into uh, department store stuff. So what we had was dead stock sweatshirts. We wanted to put a nice big piece. It needed to be patriotic. So these sweatshirts, I cannot change. I'm working on sweatshirts. These are the ones that need to be sold. We need to get them out very quickly because we have a short period of time before these have to be in the store and we want them embroidered and they have to have a coverage of around eight or so inches wide on the front of this piece. But these are very low stitch count pieces. So I went in and said, all right, what can I use about the sweatshirt to make this work? I did this scribble style flag. I did this manually. So it's not using any kind of fill. This is a manual scribble style straight stitch flag that I, I did, however, calculate my density roughly by counting how many lines of stitching were in each stripe. So I knew it was going to knock down that area around it. I left this open area inside the letters and used a nice back stitch to trace this out and to cover some of my travel stitching between the other letters. Is it perfect? No, but it looks pretty good. I managed to cover it with a modicum of stitching on the top. And we used the loft of the garment itself, the thick sweatshirts to get this embossed look. So what have I done? It's fairly savage. Why? Because instead of doing a full color, complete embroidery to get that coverage, which is what you might expect for this piece, I said, nope, I'm going to use very low stitch counts. I'm going to use like sub 10K stitches to get this big area filled. I'm, and I'm going to have to do this very quickly. So what am I getting? I'm getting back time. So I think that's really the thing that we're looking for. We're trying to get back time in this case. And in that case, we ended up getting, you know, a, a much better, you know, a much better version of what we could have had because I could have done text. I could have done full color USA in red, white, and blue. They were fully filled. And that's all I got out of that same amount of stitching. But in this case, we ended up with something that looks a lot more impactful, right? It's a lot more impactful. It's a lot more what we would expect from something that's a little higher end. And in this case, uh, the final piece I did for In Brilliance later on is a little more heavy stitch count. We got about 12,000 in there. But at the same time, we're looking at 12,000 for this essentially full coverage. We have less stitches than you would see in a detailed left chest to get full coverage on a chest design on a sweatshirt. So what we're talking about now is that's where we're talking about art and design. Now we're doing concept work to make this work out for our customer, for them to understand, you know, for them to get what they want out of their brief, but still end up, you know, getting it on time or getting it on budget. And one of the other things I did very similar to this is actually doing art and design work specifically for the uh, Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta. And it's one of the pieces I won an early award for, but I'm going to show you just briefly what this, th these pieces look like. I did them for a uh, 
for an early balloon fiesta because what ended up happening was the jacket provider could not decorate the backs and sent blank jackets in and we had to have full decorations on the backs before those jackets were given to the pilots. And the pilot jackets for Balloon Fiesta, you're not somebody who's from around here. They're a big deal. People collect them. They wear them all year round. And it's a badge of honor for uh, balloon pilots to have those pilots jackets. They had to get decorated quickly. And they had to have nice coverage and be artistic, stylistic. So I went to their original art and pulled some things out of it and tried to make something work. And I tried different things. And in fact, I have more than one version of this that I even brought up here so I can try and show you guys. But I had multiple versions that I had to figure out to kind of make that work. So we had a couple different tests, right? I originally came up with just trying to do something with light open fills. And the first piece was like this. I was like, all right, well, I'll do this gradient. So it looks brighter at the bottom than on the top. We use these light open fills. And so we have a mass coverage on the bag, but we have these different stitch counts. And also they didn't have any other elements to work with it, but the title was Launching Dreams. It had a lot of sky imagery in it. And so I drew this cool swirly cloud that was kind of based on some stuff in their original art. So that's the original testing that I started to do was playing with this stuff. And I'm like, it's interesting, but the balloons are kind of plain, they're single color. And I started playing with it and looking at the different options. And eventually I said, all right, here's the thing. We've got these shooting stars that are from your original art and your concept. We've got this cloud and the launching dreams tagline that's from the concept for this year's show. Let's go ahead and work with that. What can I do to make this work? Well, let me reduce the balloons because it usually has tons of balloons on it. Lots of detail. I said, let me reduce the number of these balloons and we'll try it out again. But then I'm going to add more color. And this is what I ended up with. This piece uses contour satin. So contour columns. As we can see, we get natural gradation because they're closer together, tighter density at the tops. As the columns get wider, there's a contour one, a plain contour. As we get tighter at the bottom, they get more dense. But also we have these flames inside that eventually ended up being run in metallic threads. So we'll go ahead and show you the final piece. This is what some of the final piece looked like. This sample is on denim that we did for our own usage, but it was actually on a nice kind of navy color. So it worked much better on the actual piece. Um, some of the texture in the denim and the multiple colors in the denim, I think, interfere with it. But you got this really cool effect where the metallic gold thread was sparkling through. So it was sparkling and you could see it through the overlying fills. And from a distance, we got this very cool kind of look where we had these densities. Now, admittedly, this piece on the denim, I don't love how it looks. We can see a little bit better of it here where we get this concept that is lighter in these sections, darker at the top and bottom. But what I really do love and you can see here is this, that we do have this lovely kind of this gold metallic thread here and the silver metallic in the cloud that allow you to get a better concept of what that looks like, where we get this idea of the flame that's used to keep hot air balloons up being part of this, the sparkle and the flicker. Because one of the great things about a balloon fiesta, we do these balloon glows at night where we light up the balloons with the uh, propane flames that are inside and you see them flicker and, and glow. And also in the first dawn patrol, the first launch that goes up where it's still a little dark in the mornings, the balloons flicker in the fall and you see them light up and you see that flame because you're looking from up underneath the balloon and you can see the flame down at that base. But in this case, we have these tongues of hot rod like flames that are done in the metallic that show through uh, of show through the embroidery on the top end. But that's the thing. These were all done in such a way that it was very low stitch count in general. Yes, 30,000 stitches on this piece, but 30,000 stitches. Look at that 30,000 stitches for an entire back for that much coverage, for that much visual detail. So that's where art and design comes into it. And you start to use other things. You're like, all right, what do I have? I've got color. I have texture that I can work with. I have the lines of stitching. I can use the lines to define volume. And I can use the texture of the stitches themselves. I can use the actual thread to give me something. The metallic adds value, even though I'm not adding more stitches to that piece. So that can absolutely work that out. I mean, it, add, it adds something extra without that stuff. So yeah, that's one of those things that's worthwhile. Um, it is something different and it does take a leap of faith because that is not what they started with. And eventually it ended up being something that we did for, um, we actually went back and did another version for the safety crew. And the one for the safety crew had the original design done with multiple colors. 
uh, as you can see here. And then they introduced this new kind of balloon that year that they called the candy cane balloons. They had these swirling stripes. You can kind of see it better zoomed out like this. But we had that same concept of those swirling stripes. And this ended up being done for all their public safety guys. And the other cool thing we did for them was we applicate on a bar of retro reflective material on the background. So we had a nice safety reflective piece and we quilted in this uh, safety badge in the background. I've taken out some of the text that was there, um, but this was the kind of outline of their original balloon safety badge that they used that was kind of quilted into the background of the piece and allowed it to be kind of subtle in the background while we had the two balloons sticking out so that the safety guys had a much cooler kind of looking um, the safety officers had a cooler looking piece that was also functional, had a nice reflective bar on it, but was interesting and, and was like the pilot jacket. So we did that later on for them too. But like I said, that when you're going into art differences, uh, when you're doing things like I showed you earlier with the, um, with the, with these uh, Kubaveras where we were changing entire pieces, someone has to trust you a fair amount to make these changes. Cause this is a, a, a large enough change to absolutely make a different look happen but we're talking about a difference of you know, 13,000, 14,000 stitches in this piece. It can make a difference to the overall cost, enough to make something worthwhile for the customer and to, to make it possible for them to add these pieces in. So interesting to do. And like I said, there are just designs that scream for applique for other stuff. I, this giant 10 inch circular piece was one that I did previously that said, hey, I wanted to do applique and they went with applique. Why? Big, giant slabs of color. It reduced tremendous amounts of stitching. If we look at that gray alone that's in this piece, you know, we have mass amounts of stitching. Uh, just in the gray alone on this piece is 34,000 stitches. You can't tell me that replacing that with an applique doesn't make a difference to the bottom line. It absolutely does. Um, same thing here. When we're doing art and design work, yeah, sometimes it takes some extra work and some trial. For this piece, we we're doing tons of these jacket backs and we had a tight schedule. They paid value for value for it. Were we trying to reduce their costs? Not that much. We were keeping it reasonable, but at the same time, we were trying to do it in a time scale that made sense. And did they value it? Yes. Not only did they value it in the original work, but they came back and had us do more work like it because it was interesting. So it's something worthwhile to think about that little subtle changes and big changes all work out when they're a conversation with the customer when they are the way that we're serving their needs, right? So think about this. And sometimes, yeah, you're adding a little extra. Hey, Cindy says, I'm starting to like my lighters, my large designs, add a little extra. Yeah, a layer underneath, very much like the rip away, uh, the rip away applique stuff can make a big difference, a little bit of sparkle. Plus the great thing about Mylar, something looks like you use a metallic thread and you didn't have to. It's a lot easier than metallic thread, believe it or not. Uh, and it's something that comes from the home style world, but I think you could still use it in the commercial world for certain stuff, for real. But suffice it to say, Whatever reason we're deciding to reduce stitch count, what I want you to think about this is, hey, whether you're going subtle or you're going savage, if you are deciding to help them with a little resizing, say, hey, readjust your desires and your understanding of what's possible with what you can actually afford, number one, and then look at it and say, does it really make sense? You know, here's the actual width of your piece printed out to size, or let me show you this piece, grab yourself a ruler. Is this really the size you need? And is it that important? If I could reduce your cost by 15% by going 10% less, is that worth it? Or even if it's just on our end where we're like, hey, I need to make a small change to it to make this run in time. Is that make sense? It's great. And honestly, we can always work on things like stitch length. I think you should go along anyway. It makes a softer hand for the garment. I think it looks better. Densities, lighter densities are going to give a better hand and honestly, less time on the machine. And these are not necessarily things you have to pass on to the customer. But if you're pricing up by stitch count, it will pass on to the customer. And I think all of us should take some time to play, whether it is art and design, whether we are going to alter some stuff and offer a different option. That's us as consultants saying, hey, check out this cool stylistic thing we can do that also saves you time or money and, and me. And it's something that can be an added value. It's an option they might not have and they might not know they have. Explain to them that there are options. So really this is about the conversation, but remember that it's about education for you too. So education for yourself, do some swatch testing, play with things, try some different applied materials and learn how they work so that when it comes to the the time to talk to the customer and you're getting into this art design side, the art alterations, you can give them that educated understanding and help them out, right? So though I say it's between subtle and savage, I'm not saying being savage to your customers, unless of course they're being savage to you, then by all means, 
in the nicest business neutral way, tell them to leave peacefully. <laughs> but I do mean that you can make changes that are either very, very subtle and don't change the look of the garment, don't change the look of the overall decoration, or you can make changes that you thought were too audacious. If you talk to your customer and make clear that they're made in pursuit of the best result that matches their needs and their abilities, as far as what they can pay for, what you can do in time, and what it does for the customer. Ask how they're gonna use it, ask what's most important in the design, ask what makes the most sense for them, and let them know what the possibilities are because you are the expert. And the best way for you to get the most value out of your customer is to be a consultant and not just a commodity. So what I'm hoping is you don't just use this stuff to reduce your stitch count so that you can give your customer something cheaper, but that you use this to provide a better experience to your customer and they meet that with the value that you're worth. All right, folks. So with that, let's get out of here. And I really hope that you guys try some new stuff today, value yourselves, spend some time on your own education, but also spend some time with the people that you love, say the stuff that you intend to say. And remember, we're spending the hours of our lives and you, I'm really blessed that you spent that hour and a half with me. All right, folks, can't wait to see you guys again next week. And, you know, stay safe out there, take care of yourselves and try something new. You never know what option will be great for you and for your customers. See you next week.